Welcome back for another edition of the Ask Nick live stream. I'm glad you're here today. We talked really in depth about a bunch of really interesting topics, at least I thought. Some good questions came in this week, including uh, really digging into how to technically be able to develop your own voice, talking about the UNT BAC Trombone Day, talking about the Music Marketing Roadmap, talking about um, how to play fast, um, and little tips and tricks to maybe how to practice playing fast. Um, and a, and a kind of long conversation about how to play more choruses, how to shape your choruses, how to tell a story. Uh, those are a couple of the questions that came in. So thanks for being here this week. Glad to have you. And uh, we'll catch you in the next one. How do you play a solo that's longer than two choruses? So that was the general gist of the question. Uh, and he's mentioned, you know, like the masters going on and on. He said unlimited choruses, I think. And I'm not sure that anybody has like technically unlimited choruses. I'm not sure I have unlimited choruses. I don't think I could uh, go on forever and ever, you know, maybe five, ten choruses. But uh, that's a really good exercise. So, you know, when I work with students, sometimes we just have them play and play because you want to get to the point where you've run out of stuff to say. Right. And that's when you start to think about what else you hear over the changes or what you over, what else you hear over a tune. So the process of playing it for a long time, it can be really uh, eye opening and ear opening to like finding new stuff. So the way to play more than two choruses is to literally play more than two choruses and sound bad for a while. Right. So you might only have two courses worth of stuff and then you'll have two and a half and then you'll have five and then you'll have 10, you know, and then you'll be able to have 50 or 100 courses of different stuff to say on a particular tune, whether it's like a short form, like a blues or a long form, you know, like a long came Betty or something slow and long. Um, it's really just about putting yourself in a position to start to connect what you hear in your head with your instrument, and regardless of it's trombone or if it's piano, guitar, whatever, it doesn't matter. You got to really um, just play. And, you know, sometimes that goes against advice I give where I'm saying, well, you can't just play because if you just play, you're just practicing bad habits. But it really is just about intentional practice and about being intentional about what you're working on right now. You know, because sometimes you're working on trying to play more. There was a time in grad school where in our improv class, it was a two hour class and we would play two tunes. We would play one tune for an hour and another tune for an hour. And we, it would be one, pretty much one version, maybe 45, 50 minutes of one tune, talk for maybe five, 10 minutes, and then another 45, 50 minutes of the next tune. And on the one hand, it was a drag because every, everything, it was so long. But on the other hand, it really helped you to say like, man, these guys played all this stuff. Now, what do I have to say on this tune? You know, it, what do I have? What is there left to say? What is the what vibe of a solo hasn't been played yet? What shape of a solo hasn't been played with played yet? What's the rhythm section doing? They're probably bored. So how do I reengage with the rhythm section and get them to play with me? Because <laughs> you don't always engage them all the time. And keeping them engaged is super important in a dynamic performance. And also just fun and also just like for good music making, you want the pe people in your band to like playing with you, I think, or else, you know, why are they playing with you? Um, so those are some ideas, uh, Lazam. I think uh, I think that you just have to do it, you know, and sound bad. And that's the thing. When you're practicing, you should be sounding bad, you know, like I, I too often when, when we have a student or when I have a student maybe like pick something to work on, it often ends up being something they sound good on already, you know. And when I pick something, it's always something that I know they're going to sound bad at for a while because that's what makes you grow. <laughs> and that's what having a, you know, a, that two way relationship with, between a teacher and a student, that's what helps you grow, I think, is like the teacher challenging you to do something that, you know, is maybe just a little bit too hard or is a little outside your wheelhouse or something you wouldn't necessarily pick and, uh, you know, trusting them and going along on that journey because it's all, it all helps in the, in the long run, you know, no matter whether it's something you don't like or something you hate, or like really hate, like even learning stuff you hate is a really good, uh, way to learn something. There was a teacher that I had, a professor and a band leader that I used to play with. His name is Dave Ravello. And he would close, we would play every week his original music in a really loud bar uh, where nobody was paying attention. It was a towny bar and nobody was paying attention to like what he was saying most of the time. Um, except for the people that were there for the music, of course, but it was a towny bar. So most people were in there just to drink. 
And uh, he would always say, close, how would he phrase it? it was, he had a great way of saying it, but he always say something like, listen to or read something that you don't agree with every day so that you challenge your own you challenge your own biases, you challenge your own uh, perceptions of what things are like or what things are real or what things are, how, how things are, you know. Uh, he would always say that you should challenge yourself. And I've taken, I've tried to take that along with me um, and I pass it along to you now. And I hope that um, you can do that, you know. Challenge yourself to really, um, you know, read stuff. That you, it challenges your point of view and, and helps you to grow as a person, you know. It's, it's not all about, <clears throat> just agreeing with yourself all the time you know you can hold contrary viewpoints it's okay and uh, you can your, your opinions can change and evolve you know I'm always I try to be the first one to admit that I don't know something or that I'm wrong you know it's like if I don't know in a lesson and we're talking about you know who's playing bass on this recording I'm like oh I don't know let's look it up let's make sure that we both know you know I'm not going to lie to you and say like oh I think it's this person no the internet is there and uh you know, if I don't know the answer to a question, I'm always trying to seek it out. So I, sometimes it's hard for people. They don't want to be wrong. But sometimes I think you have to be. You have to admit it when you're wrong because uh, you don't know everything. I just certainly don't. So I hope that helps you, um, Lizam, in terms of getting um, getting more together in terms of more courses. That was where we started with this question. I was talking about more courses. How to play more courses. Unlimited courses is actually what he said. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you can now play unlimited courses by practicing playing unlimited courses. We also played up and down that Coltrane tune for like two hours once in a, in a combo class. And at the time, we kind of thought like it was kind of jive, right? Because it was like, we're really going to play this uh, augmented scale for like an hour and like we turned off the lights and all that kind of thing and um, at first it seems kind of like a cop-out but then it's like no actually it's really helpful um, to push yourself past you know what your normal thing is your normal amount of information or like your normal stuff you play or like the normal shape of your solo or the normal vocabulary or interaction or any of that stuff so Hopefully, hopefully we'll get some people playing some hour-long versions of tunes now. Not that it's for anyone to listen to, but in terms of developing as a musician, super, super important. Uh, I know it's hard right now in, uh, in our current situation, but uh, when we get back to it, playing with more people, uh, I'm sure that that will be a useful tool in your toolkit uh, to, to develop. Can you tell me how to tell a story when you play? Oh, yeah, so... <laughs> nbelt711. So thanks for the question. That's a really good question. Um, I think that there's a lot of things like this in jazz education that we, you could either say that we take them for granted or you could say that they're cliche. And I think they're both. Uh, things like that. Things like tell a story in your solo. Leave more space. Uh, you know, things like that. And I think that those things are true, but I think that they're a little unclear because it's we don't necessarily like explain what that means or why or how. Um, so to tell a story in a solo is really, to me, this is my definition I'll give you, or what I think of if I'm trying to quote unquote tell a story. It's taking the listener on a journey, right? It's not a literal story perhaps. It's a journey, musical journey within your solo. And that means it has to have a shape and so if you start to listen to different solos to kind of graph out their shape, this will give you an idea of what it means. There are some that start off slow, right? And they're like a flat line, right? And then suddenly they might spike up and then keep going up. Or they might be kind of a rolling hill, like you're getting people interested and then you come back down to kind of draw them back in. And then you go back up in terms of intensity, volume, uh, interesting harmonic decisions, etc. And then you come back down. And then you go back up with more of that and then you come back down. And it could be that shape. It could just be a straight line where you build through the whole solo. That's the most cliche one, right? Like I'm going to build through the solo. Um, you can hear, I always send people to Roy Hargrove to talk about starting hot and coming down because there's a lot of times where he'll jump in and be like at a at a hundred percent right off the bat and then it'll kind of come down at the end of a solo um 
it can go a lot of different ways. So it doesn't have to be up. It doesn't have to be down. It can be different rolling waves, you know, in a solo. So listen to music, graph out the shape of what those solos are. It doesn't matter how I hear it. It matters how you hear it and how you translate it to your own um, aesthetic, your own way of hearing. So listen to and graph out like great solos, like go to Roy Hargrove, like I was saying, he has a huge variety of like the shape of his solo, like whether it starts high, comes down, starts low, goes up, stays at a steady state. And so that telling story thing is about that shape, number one, and then also playing things that are related to one another. So you want to stay in kind of the same box or like evolve your box of vocabulary as you go. So because if all of a sudden you're playing like pentatonic scales, diatonic pentatonic scales, and then and uh, in the key that you're in of the song, and then you start playing like crazy Coltrane substitutions and then going back and forth and back and forth, it doesn't sound connected. I'm just trying to think of like two things that wouldn't sound super connected. Not that anyone necessarily would do that, but you can you can hear or like if you're going from like early jazz like it's in the trombone thing like you'd be doing lots of glisses and lots of falls and like playing in a certain kind of swing style and you're doing that and then you mix that in with like post train free stuff it might not have like a logical storyline it might not be connected that's what people are talking about so Anyway, I think there are a lot of these type of like jazz education cliches that get thrown and bandied about uh, without being explained. So I'm glad you brought that one up. And so that's what I think it means to quote unquote tell a story while you're improvising. And that was a long answer to a potentially simple question. I'll talk talk about one other cliche uh, jazz education thing that that teachers always say. Maybe we should make a video about this. (laughs) A meme video or something. But... um, they always say leave more space, right? That's the thing. That's the thing to say. Man, it sounded great, but you know, just like leave more space. And uh, while it's true, I find it's not super helpful just to tell someone to like leave more space because it's really not specific at all, and it doesn't really help you like build a nice solo. It's just telling you like leave more space. <laughs> like, what does that mean? So it's like okay, I try. What I try to say instead is like okay, in this chorus, you were playing in this way, right? Like you were playing in a Benny Green style where you were really like playing short phrases, melodic diatonic phrases, and, but you, were, you weren't giving them enough space to breathe. They, it, was like, it was like run on sentence. It never, the punctuation never finished. And so allow for a new idea to come. So I like to think about it in terms of language and talk about you know, punctuation basically and say like you need to finish your sentence and then you need a new paragraph or you need to finish your sen- your you need to finish with a comma and then keep going on that idea like you can't just end with a comma and then go on to something else and never finish your sentence because that doesn't sound like a through line it doesn't sound like a solo that's telling a story right it's kind of related but rather than say leave more space quote unquote i like to say finish your thought end it with a period or a question mark or an exclamation point something that means it's the end and then you can be free to go on to the next idea or to a related idea so you know that's a big thing for me and i know dave meter who's been heading up our jazz improv stuff uh curriculum stuff at unt and a couple of others of us have been talking about this language-based approach uh literally talking about like language to music and also language as in jazz language to to it and it's a really i think important approach to understanding how to build jazz solos and improvise in over harmony you know and i think it applies to any genre it just it has more or less rules i guess jazz it's particularly bebop you know 45 to 60 uh era music has a lot of like tonal harmony rules that go along with uh improvising in that style so that's why I like to start there because it's the hardest, basically, and get really deep into that. And then you can kind of expand uh, both backward and forward from there because you have a kind of a good understanding of that like middle, middle ground. Most specific ground is what I also mean.
doubling bone and trumpet and sometimes leak air what to do well i don't play trumpet so i don't exactly know but i do know about leaking air are you and so there sometimes it can happen in two places one is like the side of the mouthpiece and the other is your nose so for either one there's two possible answers to that question it can either happen well, there's a couple of things where it can happen. It could be coming from the corners. It could be coming right next to the mouthpiece sometimes. Or uh, if you get really fatigued, it can sometimes even leak out your nose, which is none of which are ideal. And all of which come down to two things, tension and air flow. So we have to make sure that our air flow matches the horn that we're playing. A bigger horn takes more, a wider air column than a smaller horn, which takes a more focused air column. If you try to put a wide air column into a small hole, it's going to back up on you and cause all kinds of weirdness here, whether slowly or over time or instantly. Um, you can feel it with different mouthpieces, with different backboards. You can feel it with um, different horns with different bore size and all of that stuff. Um, there's so you really got to make sure you're playing the right size hole. So when you pick up the trumpet, you got to narrow your airstream down to make sure that it's focused. Because when you go back to playing the trombone, it's going to be a little bit bigger, obviously. Um, making sure to have a uh, have an embouchure that's set and relaxed and not like clenched. Because your muscles, if they're clenched in, as your normal set, when you get tired, it's going to loosen up and then air is going to leak. So what I try to do is focus on having a relaxed way of playing all the time. So James Burton, a great trombonist, showed this me. He's like, when you talk to a young trombonist about your chops, like just say M, like M, like mom, right? And your lips come together in a relaxed way, mom. That's how it should be. Yes, there's a little more activation here when you start to blow through the instrument. But if you're doing those sorts of things where you're like, Mm, the grinding down, like getting angry, getting your furrowed brow. I don't necessarily know that that's a good thing. So try to stay relaxed, match the air column to the size of the bore, and um, focus on the air going through the hole, not blowing at the hole and having it come back to you. So those are a couple tips uh, that have to do with, I mean, that could be small trombone to big trombone, bass trombone to, to straight tenor, uh, tuba to trumpet, you know, any of those things. Those are just some things that I've thought about, and the nose thing has been a big problem for me in the past of getting overtired and keeping on pushing, and then like air starts to leak out this way. And I'm not sure exactly what medically that is, but I know it's not good. <laughs> so uh, that means that I'm like too tense, too much pressure in my throat, and it's like doing something weird inside the back of my head. So I try to stay relaxed, focus on the air support, and focus on um, a relaxed approach. Sometimes people are too aggressive. They do like the breathing gym and they do all this nonsense where they're getting really hyped up about breathing. And no, the idea for me is be relaxed with your breath. Uh, because if you're tense with your breath, you're gonna be tense in the way you play. Tips on de developing your own vocabulary. Elliot Mason, Reggie Chapman, and Marshall come to mind. Sure, they all have very distinctive styles um, and vocabulary. And so what that is, is learning the vocabulary, learning how harmony works, right? Learning different sounds, learning uh, how those things interact uh, harmonically. And then I find you need to um, compose. Why do I say compose? Well, because composition is improvisation slowed down. And when you slow down your, your improvisation and you can actually think about it, you can start to find what are your preferences? And so what the, all those people have done that you mentioned, Elliot, Marshall, Reggie, is figure out what they like and play that, basically, in a nutshell. They know the history. They know how to construct lines. They know how harmony works on a broad scale through you know traditional uh, early harmony, like early jazz, simple harmony, like uh, something like uh, Down by the Riverside or something really kind of tonally simple to bebop tunes where things are moving in kind of a Bach-esque, Baroque-esque, very specific voice leading way. Then, then they get familiar with things like hard bop and blues stuff and uh, that blues influence coming into the harmony. And then modal, like post 
post uh, so what modal like Wayne Shorter type modal mixed mo mixed uh, what do they call it mixed mixed mode stuff. Sometimes I forget the word. <laughs> it's not really that important, but yeah, hopefully you get the gist of what I'm saying. They know that whole lineage, and then they start to slow down, compose things, tunes, lines, solos that use their preferences. And I think if you naturally just let your ear tell you what you like and be like, yeah, I like that. I like the 13 on this chord. I like the sharp 11 on this major chord. I like playing this scale over this sound. Like it sounds good to me. And slowly over time, those things develop into their style. There might be like Reggie has a great way of commanding um, all different horns he has, right? Because you've got open like a straight horn you've got one trigger you've got the other trigger and you got them together so there's four right four and he has a way of playing through those four horns in all ranges of the instrument that allow him to do play some lines that not everybody can play you know because they haven't worked it out in that way so that's an example um and, and with elliot he has an approach you can you can ask him on november 21st you should come to our workshop through UNT BAC, the trombone day, Elliot's giving a masterclass, middle of the day, 1 p.m. Eastern or 12 p.m. Central. Um, is that right? I think so. Um, so he talks about taking a shape or a line, taking a line and turning it into a shape or a sound, and then practicing that. So you take the, the horizontal and make it vertical, because maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but like, a line is a chord, and a chord is a line. Like if you stack up a major arpeggio, major seven arpeggio with all diatonic intervals, it goes like C, E, G, B, D, F, A, right? And the next one would be C, so we repeat. So if you take the right hand on the piano and put it down over the left hand and go C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, what do you get? A major scale. So when you take when you break you can break apart a scale into a vertical thing or take a vertical thing and make it into a scale so you could have some weird voicing or some weird line and kind of switch them back and forth and so that's something that when i took a lesson with elliot we talked about and it blew my mind and i was like what uh because it opens up like a whole other realm of possibility of shapes and sounds that are not limited by um, the rules of tonal harmony it's a sound or a shape that you're superimposing over so if you don't take the time to sit down and figure out what you like uh, through composing your own tunes, your own solos, uh, lines, patterns, etc., like you have no hope of like developing your own sound. What I always say is your sound will develop on its own. If you build strong fundamentals, you know the history, you know how to uh, play over harmony, like those things first, and then you follow your instinct, follow your gut like, what do you like how do you hear music you know you find people that hear it similar to you and you and you go ahead and uh get with them you know so someone who hears music similarly to me and we've talked about um harmony a lot a lot of times is lucas pino that's the guy who plays tenor in my band and i usually play in his non-it um we we hear how harmony moves in terms of voice leading first and that informs the way that you write because it doesn't actually matter what the chords are if the voice leading is strong, which is something that for me, I got from listening to a lot of Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn is because their tunes, while they are very tonal, the stronger thing and any weird notes that you hear in those big man arrangements all come from having strong lines within the tunes, which comes from the voice leading. So this is way more information than you probably <laughs> I wanted, wanted from this question, um, Drew B. Taylor, but uh, that's a start. So that's how you develop your own sound. So number one, don't worry about it. Number two, it'll happen naturally if you do it, those, those prerequisites and then give yourself a chance. You know, you have to give yourself a chance to develop and give yourself a chance to develop in that way because you're not going to do it in a vacuum. That's for sure. You need other musicians. You need experiences. You need preferences you need to make musical decisions about what you're good at and be okay with like I'm good at this thing so I'm going to lean into it you know I hear music this way that's why someone should hire you instead of me right because I hear music the way I hear music and you're going to hear it the way that you hear it so um, I know again long answer to a, kind of a simple question but 
Um, it's multifaceted, really. It has to do with a lot of things. And the last thing I'll say about that question before moving on, I see there's one here on Facebook, um, is that you have to also be a master of your instrument. And that really comes before anything really super advanced because if you can't express it on your instrument, there's no way. Like Marshall, those are guys are all great examples. Marshall, Elliot, and Reggie of super technicians of the instrument can play anything and then they can improvise anything. But a lot of times we get caught up in that like, oh, we gotta go to, like transcribe these guys because they can do this incredible stuff but really it comes from an understanding of the horn first, being able to execute really difficult technical passages so that that technique is in the back of their mind and they can actually just play with the hear, right? So um, sometimes we come at it the opposite way, like, oh, I can't quite get it, like I'm playing this line and it's really hard and whatever, but really it comes from mastering the instrument first and being free to um, express what's in your mind's ear that's what i'm always trying to figure out with my practice with my students it's like what can i practice that's going to like level up my musicianship to a point where i can play what i hear in my head whether it, and maybe for some people that isn't is more melodic and less technical you know and so they need a little less but for some people they want to play crazy brecker stuff on the trumpet or whatever they got to have a lot of facility you know, so you got to kind of work back and forth from your your goals, basically, how you want to sound. So, you know, I, I think it's a it's a balance of like, what should you learn? You know, like all the history stuff with being open to learning, you know, new stuff and kind of being open to what's happening now and influences from musicians around you. So it'll happen naturally, slowly. But as long as you keep your mind open to what your preferences are, I think that uh, if you're working hard on the fundamentals, it's going to naturally find its way into your playing. Are there any trombonos whose sound you have wanted to get into but have not had a chance to get to? Oh, that's a good question. So I'll, I will expand on trombonists to listen to and ones that I have wanted to listen to more that I haven't gotten into. Um, you know what I found this week? One of my students showed it to me was um, Albert Mangelsdorf and Jaco Pistorius. So uh, this is some... I've been meaning to like listen to Albert Mangelsdorf more because he doesn't play anything like I play, and he, I want to know more about that. Um, so there's one Albert Mangelsdorf. There's specifically a trio with Jaco Pistorius. What, I forget what they called it, but um, there's him. There's people like Gretchen Moncor that I've never really gotten into. I've been, I've wanted to get more into Julian Priester or Vic Dickinson, and. Uh, Quentin Jackson. I really like those guys from the Ellington band. Um, those lesser known guys from the Ellington band because Ellington had such a way of writing for people that it's like so interesting to hear them. I mean, I'm a big fan of Lawrence Brown, of course. Well, I don't know. Maybe you don't know that, but um, I'm a big fan of Lawrence Brown. And uh, I he has both plunger work and solo horn stuff that's just incredible. Um, so a, a lot of those guys, I haven't been able to check out quite as much. Uh, one, because there's less recordings of them and you got to dig a little harder. Not Gretchen, really. You can find those. But um, those are a few. I've wanted to dig in a little more deeply, honestly, to like other, some harmonic stuff from other players, uh, non trombonists that I haven't gotten a chance to. I haven't really gotten the chance to really dig deep on anyone in a while. Um, you know, focused mostly on, on teaching the last couple of of years so it's been um you know more along the columns of the, the other question about what are some of your favorite listening references you know like so i've been thinking a lot about like people to go check out that i think are important to develop fundamentally but um you know dickie wells is an interesting one i had a student kind of digging deep into um uh jack t garden sorry uh jack t garden and i always find something in those people Every time I bring them back up, you know, there's something about how they play that's super interesting. There was a long time when I was obsessed with Wycliffe Gordon as a young player. And so like his connection to some of those older players becomes really obvious when you start to study them. So that's always really interesting. Um, I've been wanting to learn more Wayne Shorter compositions because um, I, I find that he has a really natural way of blending um, great melody with complex harmony, uh, interesting modal harmony, and that's something that I'm 
interested in as well. Uh, but actually just like studying his compositions a bit more. Uh, but um, those are a few things. Those are a few, Peter. Uh, I know maybe they're not that interesting, but uh, Julian Priester, did I say that? And um, yeah, and then also like I'd really like to dig on some of my, you know, contemporaries. Like I've never really transcribed Marshall or Elliot for that matter. I have a little bit, but like mostly just like, oh yeah, he plays this and then go to play it, right? And it's like, man, but it would be nice to dig into those things a little more just as a challenge, you know? Or Michael Deese, obviously, he's got incredible stuff. But, you know, the person that I always come back to. And so I'm going to transition now to the, to the people that I think you should listen to uh, is Steve Davis, man. And he sounds so good no matter what the context is. He plays in Chick Corea's last record. He plays on um, one of Chick's records with a symphony and the band, uh, what was it called, in the early 2000s. They recorded a DVD set at um, the Blue Note. It's red. Anyway, I can't remember. Um, but uh, yeah, so Steve Davis, he's got a lot of his own records. He played with Art Blakey, he was the last trombonist in Art Blakey's band, you know. So I don't know, he's got like such a melodic way of playing that combines a lot of the best parts of Curtis and JJ and Slide into a relaxed, accessible approach you know and like an accessible ap approach is important especially when you're teaching especially when you're talking to younger students like that that is a really important connection point like if you so show them a Marshall solo or an Elliott solo it's going to be really hard but if you can find some swinging stuff that's really hip and not too hard um, it can be a really inspiring experience so that's somebody I love to listen to, and anytime he has a new record, gonna check it out, hands down, 100%. Um, then, uh, the big people for me are JJ Curtis Slide, the big three for me. Um, so JJ Johnson, everything, Curtis Fuller, all of it. Slide, as much as you can find, there's not as much. But Slide also is a good example of, um, so Slide, a great example of a person who is uh, both an arranger and a trombonist. So he's going to be a great, uh, a great way of like externalizing your improvisation and then internalizing. So Slide for me is really important. And uh, yeah, those three, JJ Curtis Slide. And then after that, it's three contemporaries. Like they're, you know, like a generation or maybe it's more than a generation. I forget exactly what the delineation is, but like those three and then the next ones are like Wycliffe Gordon, Steve Ture, and Steve Davis for me. And Robin Eubanks is in there too. I had a really uh, strong Robin Eubanks period when I was in college, in undergrad, with the Dave Holland Quintet in particular and trying to like figure that whole thing out because I just felt like he could improvise so freely and I wanted to be able to also improvise that freely. Um, so for whatever that's worth. So that's a list. I know it's a lot of things, but if you only listen to one, I think that educationally speaking, Steve Davis might be the best person to go and transcribe because it's accessible. It's coming right out of the JJ and Curtis school. And then uh, it's just a solid, really solid melodic swinging foundation from which to kind of build upon in whatever direction you want to go. If you want to go more in a, um, you know, a West Coast kind of situation, like a watchress kind of vibe, or like, uh, you know, Kurt, uh, Carl Fontana, whatever, uh, go that way from there, or go towards, you know, a more hard, hard bop kind of Curtis JJ slide kind of way. I mean, either way is good. It's just a different approach and style and a little bit different voc vocabulary and approach to the music. Um, and so the best way to play fast, to practice uh, getting better at playing fast or improvising fast is to improvise slow as if you're playing fast so play a medium blues but go go i'm doing a multiple tongue but slow so the multiple tongue slow will help you to um uh be comfortable at a faster tempo um playing with a multiple tongue because you're gonna have to to play fast and improvise so you got to number one practice slow as if you're playing fast that's the short answer so do the multiple tongue slow 
Get your multiple tongue just as clean and even as if uh, as your single tongue. So whether you're doodle tonguing or double tonguing, it doesn't really matter. Do your thing, but uh, make it as clean as your single tongue either way. And that way uh, you can play fast, fast. <laughs> so play fast like you're playing fast when you're playing slow. And that way when you play fast, it's clean, clear, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, doodle, double, doesn't matter. Triple, et cetera. Um, do that and have good slide technique because if you have clunky slide technique there's no way for you to play clean and fast uh, that is 100 percent true i will say that we'll see you later thanks for being here and uh, we'll catch you on the 21st for sure